The space-to-space -space communication also points to another critical feature of SDI, independent operation of weapon systems. If one part of the entire SDI system fails or is destroyed, the others must proceed as instructed by themselves. Phase one weapons are all kinetic kill vehicles. The two systems are brilliant pebbles and ground-based interceptors. GBI focuses on mid-course or exoatmospheric RVs and will be fired from CONUS bases. In 1987, the flaggy or flexible lightweight agile guided experiment successfully intercepted a theater type missile reentry vehicle using a radar guided interceptor. Between the 1984 hitting a bullet with a non-nuclear bullet test and the 1987 flaggy test, the problem became less hitting and destroying the target than finding and seeking the target. ARIS, or Exoatmospheric Reentry Vehicle Interceptor Subsystem, will test all the issues created by a mid-course intercept, including optical seeker, divert, and axial propulsion, all under stressing conditions. One of the keys is to eliminate the effects of GBI's thrusting environment as it streaks up through the atmosphere seeking its mid-course target. While other sensors in SSTS and GBR or ground-based radar may locate the target, onboard sensors must function in order to allow any GBI to seek and destroy its target. This is done primarily with infrared seekers. Initial validation tests will be conducted using a standard Minuteman 1 ICBM with a KKV mounted as the payload. In its operational phase, the GBI will be smaller than the second stage of a Minuteman. The ARIS kinetic kill vehicle carries all its own systems, including avionics, divert propulsion, infrared seeker, and kill enhancement device to improve lethality. The first full ARIS test flights are scheduled for 1991. The heart of SDI Phase 1 will undoubtedly be Brilliant Pebbles. It is smaller and smarter, hence the move from Smart Rocks to Brilliant Pebbles. As a kinetic kill vehicle, BP carries no warheads. Its mission is to find and destroy boost and post-boost enemy vehicles simply by running into them, like throwing a rock at a bottle. At the incredible closing speeds of a BP vehicle and a boosting rocket, over 14,000 kilometers per second, the two simply liquefy and literally pass through each other. Since the time window to acquire and track a boost or post-boost vehicle is so short, any first layer system must be space-based. There isn't time to get it into position. It must always be there. Red team, blue team countermeasure analysis has shown the singlet system to be the most effective. While packing up to 12 brilliant pebbles on one station would be more efficient, it becomes a meaningful target to an enemy in much the same way a post-boost bus is. When the system is deployed, brilliant pebbles will consist of 4,067 individual weapons poised in space, ready to strike. The cost of destroying a singlet system approaches the cost of a nuclear attack by an enemy. It's just not feasible. Once the attack command is issued, Brilliant Pebbles is self-contained and independent. Each pebble carries a life jacket to protect its computers and components from radiation and the whole unit from space dust and debris. The jacket also contains the solar array to power the weapon while it sits quietly in space, waiting to strike. Since a geostable orbit would put the pebble too far away to get to its target in time, each pebble has a star tracking system which monitors its location at all times. Its own tracking and communication systems allow BP to find and attack its boosting and post-boost target independently and ensure that each pebble attacks a different target with no further information from C cubed once the release command is issued. One of the most significant SDI tests to date was the full duration flight test of a space-based interceptor soon to become Brilliant Pebbles. This hover test brought together all the elements of acquisition, tracking, control, and independent operation. 
This vehicle is tracking a heat source, similar to a boosting rocket on the other side of the wall. It is operating totally on its own. One of the most exciting moments is when the system handed off the plume to the missile hard body for final lethal intercept. While it must remain in space indefinitely, the active life of a brilliant pebble is under 30 seconds. At the end of 1990, another hover test was successfully conducted. Here, the vehicle, with all its controls and lethality, is tiny compared to the first test vehicle. This miniaturization reduces the cost of boosting into space and makes a brilliant pebble truly a pebble and much more difficult to find. SDI Phase 2 consists of programs and systems with longer lead times and more technology challenges. They are designed to provide layers to SDI. A layered, multifaceted series of defense systems is the heart of an SDI strategy. Knocking out or countermeasuring any one system does not render SDI ineffective. There are two kinetic weapons and three speed of light weapon systems. Head eye, hypervelocity gun, neutral particle beam, space based laser, and ground based laser. Head eye, or high endo atmospheric defense interceptor, is similar to phase one GBI. Only head eye strikes RVs in terminal phase just after any remaining decoys are stripped away by the atmosphere. In an ideal situation, head-eye would not be needed because all warheads would have been destroyed in boost or mid-course. The hypervelocity gun, or HGG, is in some ways the simplest weapon. A very, very high-speed projectile fired from space or ground through electromagnetic acceleration. Neutral particle beams have been propagated on Earth for some time. They are immensely powerful, but the real question is, how will they behave in the vacuum of space? And can the accelerators and power systems be made small enough to be put into space? Laser weapons are both ground and space-based. Right now, the space-based laser may be the most effective in the interactive discrimination of targets from decoys. They would be chemical lasers. Ground-based lasers can get all the power they need. There are no real size limitations. The challenge is to get the beam into space through the atmosphere and direct it to a target. The first head-eye flight test was conducted January 26, 1990. It lasted only seven seconds, but it proved a lot. At the very high speeds achieved by head-eye, at least 7,800 feet per second, both the bow wave and heat at the nose tip of the vehicle can make the seeker sensors unreliable. A cryogenic cooler is sprayed over the LWIR window. This instantly reduces the temperature to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. While all the attention in SDI is focused on the weapons and kills themselves, without something as seemingly mundane as cooling a seeker window for just a few seconds, there could be no intercept no high-impact, high-visibility effect. Imagine firing a hockey puck so fast it will penetrate one inch of tempered steel. That essentially is an HVG. It's like a machine gun, only the bullets are accelerated not by a chemical explosion, but by electromagnetic acceleration. The acceleration is 100,000 Gs. That's right, 100,000 times the force of gravity. To put it in perspective, a fighter pilot maxes out at about 10 Gs. HVGs can be space-based or ground-based. The launch velocity of a space-based gun would be about 10 kilometers per second. A high-powered hunting rifle carries a muzzle velocity of 2,900 feet per second. HVG muzzle velocity is over 32,000 feet per second. You can see what it does to steel plating. Imagine what it can do to the thin skin of a ballistic missile. Neutral particle beam is one of the more exotic SDI systems. It works primarily by totally scrambling the control and computer systems of the incoming missile or RV. A neutral particle beam is a stream of highly accelerated negative ions the technology has been around for years. 
In fact, one promising approach is the Soviet-developed RFQ, or Radio Frequency Quadrupole System. Its chief advantage is its lightweight. NPB can also be used to mark or paint warheads and allow other kill weapons to distinguish warheads from decoys. A major challenge is to reduce the size of NPB accelerators so they can be boosted into space and to generate the kind of power needed. Accelerator size has been reduced substantially, as you can see, but it is mandatory that power in the range of 50 MEVs be maintained. That's 50 million electron volts. The BEAR test, launched on July 13, 1989, was the first successful operation of a directed energy weapon in space. It proved that directed energy can be reliably operated in space.